The title of what I have to say is The Politics of Digital Infrastructure in Cities, okay? And I want to, I want to get you to think through what we mean by infrastructure, both in an urban context, a city of four or five million people like Berlin, but in a society where the digital is pervading everything, where the digital is mediating every micro aspect of every dimension of our lives. And this is a transformation that has come on um, in a profoundly rapid and unpredictable and sometimes bewildering way. So let's kick off with the obvious point that cities are and cities always have been the sort of key hubs of infrastructural society. We're going right back to the origins of cities. They are always the hubs that concentrate infrastructure that become possible through infrastructure. And in the latest transformations of digitized infrastructure and digital infrastructure, we're just seeing the, la the, the latest manifestation of a very old process. And in a way, infrastructures historically, in terms of modern cities, industrial cities, have been a way of making what geographers call nature into culture. They bring all of the resources, all of the uh, water, energy and food and communications into cities from all of the distant hinterlands that serve cities, often that's very contested and so on, and they, they move all of the things out of cities that we want to leave, we want to remove through the wastes and, and uh, outputs of, of the city. These can be in gas form, through pollution, they can be in water form, they can be in produced form, all of the products and services. So digital media are interfacing with big questions about who we are as people, our very bodies are caught in these webs of infrastructure. And these are webs of infrastructure that are often invisible. Without the infrastructure, we simply can't live. That's the bottom line. If you imagine Berlin without the vast array of um, food infrastructures, logistics infrastructures, energy, water, waste, as well as digital media, which allows all the rest to function these days, we would be in a state of massive crisis. You try living without electricity for a week, and you start to realize that the always-on, switched-on infrastructural city is always, always linked to those flows. Historically, a lot of people like Marshall McLuhan thought the city was anachronistic, it was old-fashioned, it was going to be literally disinvented as people could do all of their communication remotely from wherever they wanted to live. So if you look at some of these quotes, Martin Pauli, an architect, says, uh, in urban terms, once time has become instantaneous, you can send anything anywhere, any time, at light speed, space becomes unnecessary. There's almost a sense that we're going to inhabit cyberspace. And cyberspace was very much seen as a separate world in the, in the 80s and the 90s. Marshall McLuhan says the city is a form of major dimensions, and this is in 1964, must inevitably dissolve like the fading shot in a movie. So why has that not come to pass? We are now living in the most urbanized age in the history of our world, and it's the most digitized age in the history of our world. My argument is that's not a surprise. My argument is that digital media, digital technologies facilitate urbanization and relate really closely and subtly to the fact that we're all here today. If, in, if media was so fantastic, why would, why would you all come here to see a face-to-face -face exposition of an argument? You know? Place still matters, and arguably matters as much as ever, despite the incredible growth of digital technologies. These new media, and this is going back to 1990s, this, this was deemed to be quite a revelation, given this weight of debate from North America that somehow cities were going out of fashion. What the uh, argument is, that far from going out of fashion, these digital media reanimate and reorganize places in ways that are so, so important and so hard to understand because they're so political and yet so hidden. And I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. So let's just take some examples. 
Just think, I would say, of this humble device in your pocket. Think how the smartphone has remediated the camera, the video camera, the map, cartography, computer databases, the telephone, rather obviously, global navigation systems, and so on and so forth, global retail and shopping and logistics systems. Because that phone is a portal into a, an unknowably complex set of infrastructures that straddle the world. Every time you use the GPS on that system, you are connecting to 24 geostationary satellites owned by the US Air Force that are the same things used to drop bombs on targets in Afghanistan. Okay. Behind this front end is this vast backstage, the backstage of global information infrastructure. I want to move now on to the question of smart cities. It's a word that's everywhere, just as digital cities were or virtual communities were 20 years ago or cyberspace perhaps 25, 30 years ago or wired cities in the 1960s. There's a very long history um, to the idea of political and governance communities, uh, real estate organizations, place marketing organizations trying to sell their cities by making them look high-tech. Remember Berlin with its electricity infrastructures in the 1920s and 30s? Uh, the last 30 or 40 years, it's been profoundly about who's more digital and more futuristic, as we were hearing with Toby. And the smart city rhetoric is powerful at the moment. It's coming out of the, corp the IT corporations, it's coming out of the cities themselves and the real estate organizations and so on. And it builds on a whole set of debates um, that surround pervasive and ubiquitous computing and the way it's permeated everyday life in terms of bodies, buildings, cities, spaces, and infrastructures. Um, on the back of the Internet of Things, uh, ubiquitous computing, social media, the massive growth of uh, Google Earth and based cartography and navigation systems, um, and it's very much a sort of cybernetic idea that this time, despite all of the failures with previous information systems in cities, we will have perfect information. We will have perfect optimization. We will be able to control all of the complex systems that connect cities in terms of nature, ecology, infrastructure, services, government, and so on. What's very important, I think, given what Toby was saying about this urge to be futuristic, this urge to sell your city as a high-tech hub, as a center of digital innovation and so on, is it's about symbolic power, the symbolic power of the digital, but also the symbolic power of new physical landscapes. And the history of all of these projects is very much to sell the future. William Gibson famously said that the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed, right? Now, a lot of city agencies and developers are trying to say, we are here, we are the future. Dubai is fantastic at this. Dubai has actually employed um, futuristic sci-fi uh, script editors and, and thinkers to say, how can we look like the future? The final point I want to say about the smart city idea is that it's asocial. It's a non-social view of the future. It's an entire technological, technocratic view of the future city, which I think gets the entire um, logic wrong. What we need are social visions of the future of cities, which start with all of the pressing uh, social political concerns, environmental concerns. Then, if digital media are, are part of the solution, that's fine. But uh, they're, they're trying to squeeze every aspect into this more data, more data. Adam Greenfield, who's done some really interesting critical work on smart cities, puts it this way. He says that smart, this is a quote, smart cities tend to be discussed casually as if, as if it were self-evident that all one needed to do to finally solve the city, remember the IBM quote earlier on, is to weave sensors into the urban fabric by the million, 
to all the relevant social networks for geo-tagged utterances and apply just the right analytical algorithms to the ever-mounting tally of tetrabytes captured this way. A lot of the smart city labs seem to be full of very, very bright people trying to do stuff just because the data's there, in other words, which I think is a, getting it entirely wrong. There are some much more interesting and challenging grassroots social activist platforms. There's a long history of those that I haven't got the expertise to go in, which start with the social. They start with human lives in place and then build from there. This is just one example, which is the work of Christian Nold in East London, who's actually started to tag people as they move around East London to see how stressed they are encountering the pollution and the danger of the various vehicles and highways around East London, with a way of mobilizing for environmental and social justice. So I hope this hasn't been a too grim and too paranoid sense of the, the network and the digitization of, of urban space. What I hope I've given you a, a flavor of is the subtlety of how everyday encounters between people in places, the things that keep and always will keep cities going, is now so completely mediated um, in, in all sorts of ways by a new set of infrastructures. So thanks very much for, for coming.